Parliamentary Review Forum for discussing some of the most important issues that face not only local government but communities throughout Victoria. Um, and I'm particularly pleased to be here tonight in the fantastic role of moderator where I don't have to be an expert on anything and I get to listen to the people that are, um, but still get to participate on a topic as important as, a, as affordable housing. Um, as Mark alluded to, the ABS statistics came out over the last 24 hours and they, they paint a pretty rough picture of homelessness uh, in Australia and Victoria. Mark mentioned uh, 25,000 people in, in Victoria currently homeless, according to the ABS. Across the country, that's uh, over 115,000, and that's 50 people in every 10,000 people. Um, and I think particularly importantly, um, over 43,000 people under the age of 25. Uh, and 27,000 per 10,000 people over the age of 65. And at per capita, we're doing some particular work with women over 55 who are at risk of homelessness. They're the fastest growing group of people in Australia at risk of homelessness at the moment. And that's really terrifying. Um, so, of course, affordable housing is an issue for many people across the country. It's not just homelessness that affects affordable housing, but uh, as we hear often in the papers, the ability of people to own their own home. In Australia, traditionally, home ownership has been seen as a like. Uh, it's increasingly becoming a privilege. Um, and also affordable rental housing. It, 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 as, as prices at the top end of the market, uh, home ownership increasingly become out of reach and have knock-on effects throughout the system. Uh, and so it's a particularly important issue for local councils. It's a difficult challenge given the economics of housing development and the pressure for residents who often don't want to see high or medium density development in their suburbs. Uh, and that's an important consideration for council planning schemes. Of course, they all sit under the uh, policy objectives of the Planning and Environment Act. In late 2017, the Planning Minister in Victoria, Richard Wynne, introduced amendments to that Act. And they provide a clearer policy objective for affordable housing, particularly under Section 173. That gave councils greater clarity around voluntary agreements between councils, developers and landowners to provide affordable housing in Victoria. And tonight we'll be from three distinguished speakers on that issue. Uh, we'll be starting off with Fiona Delahunt, who is Executive Director of Forward Policy and Business Strategy at the Department of Environment, Land, Work and Planning. Um, Fiona's got the enviable, unenviable task of making these policies work on the ground and working with the voluntary agreements. Um, Fiona will provide an overview of recent changes to the Planning Act and she'll uh, particularly talk about that in relation, to, in relation to affordable housing and the intended policy aims and objectives of those changes. We'll then hear from Nicola Foxworthy, who's Program Director at Common Equity Housing Limited, CEHL. That's Victoria's largest registered housing association and it partners with member cooperatives to deliver an effective, sustainable housing program that seeks to empower people and build strong communities. Nicola, importantly for tonight's discussion, also chairs the Affordable Housing Industry Advisory Group. This is an alliance of Victoria's leading residential development and affordable housing peak bodies. Uh, Fiona and I were talking about how important that relationship with peak bodies is in managing these processes. Um, it also in, in, involves private and not-for-profit development and financing organisations and reputable industry advisors. And that group, uh, which Nicola leads, currently utilises cross-industry expertise to inform and influence government decision-making and tries to ensure that housing policies are viable and sustainable, not only um, to meet immediate um, policy goals, but over the long term to positively contribute to affordable housing supply. And finally, we'll hear from someone as a resident of the City of Port Phillip that I've always admired, um, Frank O'Connor, who's uh, had a long and storied history in local government. Uh, and particularly in the area of, of social inclusion and affordable housing. Um, I almost don't have time for this there, Frank, but you're a director of Good Shepherd Australia in New Zealand, a director of the Inner South Community Health Service, chairperson of Napier Street Aged Persons Care Services, and a council member of Reconciliations Victoria. Importantly for tonight, he is the president of the Port Phillip Housing Association and a former councillor of the city of Port Phillip, and before that, the South Melbourne Council Mayor, who were mayor for two years. Um, Frank's been an ad active advocate on the affordable housing issue for many years and he has a, certainly a unique perspective given his local government background which will be of interest to all of you tonight. Um, but that's enough for me. As I said, I'm not the expert, I'm just the moderator. So I'm going to um, pass those around to Fiona. Uh, he's going to tell you what this process looks like from within public service itself. Thanks. Thank you, Emma. And thank 
you to the BLGA for inviting me to participate in the discussion. So between uh, Nicola, Frank and I, it was decided I'll do this setup for you um, because really in the context of housing affordability and affordable housing, uh, what the Minister for Planning did with the amendments to the Planning Environment Act last year is really just one slice and one tool that can be used to actually make sure that the land use planning system can do a bit more heavy lifting in terms of contributing to um, affordable housing. Um, and we have been partnering with Nicola and a number of others, including a lot of councils in the development of the tools that we need in order to give effect to this. So, um, the amendment to the Planning Environment Act actually um, included a new objective to, for the land use planning system to facilitate the, um, the supply of affordable housing. And why did we do that? Well, there's two key references. Plan Melbourne, um, so the state's strategy for, for Melbourne, but it can relate statewide recognise that more could be done in the social and affordable housing area by the planning system. And we also knew that um, many councils with developers and housing associations were actually trying to use what we call Section 173 agreements to um, facilitate affordable housing um, outcomes and development applications. And we, knew, and we know um, that uh, some have been successful, and certainly Port Phillip can talk about that, but others have been hampered by uncertainty because you need three parties to, to agree. The whole issue about how you give effect to a 173 agreement has been inconsistently applied, and often um, the actual negotiations and the outcomes fail, so there is no affordable house, housing outcome in a development application. The other side of it is there's a need for legal certainty um, and where the role of the planning system actually sits. And this has been an issue in BCAT, where, as you know, councils have been taken to BCAT saying, well, what's the policy basis on, upon which you're trying to work with the developer or require the developer an affordable housing outcome? And also the issue of what the definition is. So we needed to provide some clarity that in the context of the planning system, what do we mean by affordable housing? So basically, what are the amendments? Um, and these were set September last year um, to facilitate the provision of affordable housing in Victoria. And it's not very often that that act is actually changed. So it is significant that the whole concept and definition of affordable housing is now in the Planning and Environment Act. And in terms of these Section 173 agreements, the other thing to remember is that these are voluntary agreements. This is not being mandated. Um, and really it's just the start of being able to have a more workable mechanisms for councils, developers and housing associations actually to be able to have a mechanism by which they can deliver some affordable housing. And basically, with the voluntary agreements, we're saying a council may enter into an agreement with the owner of the land for the development or provision of land for affordable housing. And, um, and it also introduces the, um, a specific definition of affordable housing that I'll take you through in a minute. What the amendments don't do um, is um, uh, mandate. And um, really what we're trying to do is to simply make the process by which the three parties can enter into an agreement easier, but it does rely on them being voluntary. Um, so in terms of the definition, um, the, the thing to keep in mind is this isn't a statewide definition that applies across all realms of um, state policy. It's specific to really the limitations that we have in something like the Planning and Environment Act. And so for the purposes of the Act, and that's sort of quite important to remember, Affordable housing is housing which includes social housing, and social, by social housing we mean public housing, things that are under the Housing Act and the Director of Housing. So we picked that up and basically said all of the policies and requirements relating to social housing are in that package, and affordable housing can include social housing. But basically, affordable housing is something that is appropriate to the housing needs of the following. 
very low-income households, low-income households, and moderate-income households. And what we have to do, which will be in place by 1 July, is we will have a governor and council order that actually specifies um, what the income ranges are derived from ABS data. Um, and I won't go into the specifics of those, but um, you know, I can, we can provide information later. And my colleague Richard Watling, who is our Principal Housing Researcher in Planning and Further Department, is here to help with any technical issues you have. So what does, and it's a classic issue with legislation, what does appropriate for the housing needs of these households actually mean? So the way, again, you know, it's sort of technically lumpy in order to come up with something voluntary. But basically we're saying for the purposes of de determining what is appropriate for housing needs, there are certain criteria that the parties have to have regard to. And what we're doing is the Minister publishes that in a notice. So we've got two statutory instruments, a Governor and Council order that specifies the incomes relating to very low, low and moderate, and we have a notice that is um, going to outline the key criteria and considerations that parties have to have when entering into an agreement. And I guess the important thing there um, as well is it's not to include price ranges, so what is determined to be an affordable price of housing in a particular area or the cost of rent. Um, and there's specific reasons around that as well. So I've covered off the two orders. Um, the other thing that, we're going, that we've been working on is um, a model or a draft Section 173 agreement. Um, 173 agreements basically in the Act is something that the Council and a uh, uh, proponent can enter into for all sorts of things. Um, and so what we've been working on is an agreement that can be the basis upon which Councils can um, negotiate these agreements. But importantly, and in the context of what we're talking about tonight, the key issue is around, uh, we're developing up guidance. Um, one of the clear things from a number of workshops we um, had with you know, over a count, 100 council representatives last year was the need for capacity building and specific guidance to council officers um, to how, how do you actually go about, what is the starting point and how do you enter into an agreement or seek an agreement with a party, with the other two parties being the developer and a housing association. So we're currently finalising what would be interactive guidance and what works, lots of case studies and, and things like that. And we need all of this in place by, um, uh, by, by 1 June. So I think the important things is, you know, yes, there's a, you know, an amendment to an act. Yes, we have um, two statutory instruments, a governor and council and a notice. Yes, we'll have a model agreement and guidance, but what does it actually mean? And really what we want to do is um, provide the policy certainty so that these agreements can actually um, thrive and that, you know, um, affordable housing outcomes can be achieved in many developments. We want local government to actually um, be able to support councils to build the capacity to actually understand how to negotiate these agreements. And certainly we've had feedback about, you know, what it, each party needs to understand um, what, uh, what each other party is interested in. So from the developer point of view, there are development economics. From a housing association point of view, who are going to, you know, manage the stock, it's, is what's on offer actually what is needed? So it needs to match what um, the specific needs are of an area. And for council, is it actually achieving its policy outcomes? And does it have really a basis for which it's asking for specific percentages, numbers or dollars? Um, and the reason a number of these have fallen over is because nobody knows what the starting point actually is. So very much the intent with you know, putting the technicalities of legislation and change aside, what we're seeking to do is work with the sector and with local government to make this a workable voluntary agreement process. So really by the 1st of June it will be the starting position. Um, we're currently looking at um, in the new uh, financial year what sort of capacity building um, brokering that the state government could be involved in. Because bear in mind, once this is in place, 
the state isn't involved. What we're doing is setting up the framework and the mechanism, but we're not at the table, we're not dictating, we're just hoping to see very good outcomes. So maybe what I'll do is I'll leave it there, I think that's my 10 minutes, and hand over to Nicola. Thanks, Fiona. So, thanks for the opportunity to put forward, uh, I guess, a view from what is an emerging affordable housing industry, one, an industry that hasn't actually existed as a holistic industry in Victoria at all. So, we've had for profit housing developers, we've had not for profit housing developers and affordable housing associations, a whole bunch of other housing providers and things. It's not that there wasn't affordable housing happening in different ways in public housing, but the notion of these players coming together as an industry and creating actually a market for affordable housing, I think we're right at the beginning end of that. Clearly, local governments have an important role to play in how that industry develops and how it gets applied in each of those areas. So I think it's a real opportunity here for the community to talk through what this uh, advisory group has been trying to do and how it might play into this space. So, thanks for the opportunity. So the Affordable Housing Industry Advisory Group actually formed around the opportunity to provide submissions into the Plan Melbourne Refresh because that refresh started talking about the very beginnings of an affordable housing industry or at least a framework that might uh, support or seek affordable housing in some scenarios. And industry players across the for-profit and not-for-profit and I guess the finance industry some of the messages that were coming out of that refresh were kind of going, hmm, that might be a little bit interesting in the way that it might ultimately get implemented. So the group effectively formed to be able to harness the, the real world, on the ground, technical experience of these players to be able to, uh, in the first instance, and I guess our strongest rationale, to be able to uh, inform and advise state government in this instance about what would actually happen if you went this way versus that way when you put it on the ground, and it's a pretty important thing. I think, um, so there's a number of players, I think, as uh, Emma alluded to before. So the, the head bodies for property industry, UDIA Property Council, head body for the community housing uh, industry sector, uh, the chair, Vic, uh, a number of the uh, Bigger housing associations, the Victorian Housing Association, not all of them, but a fair number of them. Uh, some banking representation, some investment representation, which is a very critical component of an affordable housing industry. And some of the key uh, consultancies that work across this stuff all the time, coming together and, and kind of committing voluntarily, in fact, to, to harness that technical knowledge and make it available both to each other. So there's a big conversation going on between for profits and not for profits and, and trying to understand what that all means for everyone, but also outwardly to state government, to local government. So there's a number of things that, that you can bring to the table that will actually help underpin the development of what, in an ideal world, in, 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 will, will become an affordable housing industry that makes a real dent in the need for affordable housing in Victoria and potentially beyond that uh, as we go forward. So the objectives of the group to utilise industry experience to inform and influence government decision making. And really, that was about making sure that the decisions that get made are workable on the ground. I think we've got some examples in place now where the intent was clearly very good, but actually in the practicalities of making it work didn't work quite so well, so they're a bit of this fish. And I think most local governments would have some experience of that as well. So the group was kind of going, well, no, something about this. And actually, if we're at the table earlier, we, we, we really could contribute to making something that is really workable rather than something that just misses. And then to advocate to government to provide the framework, the, the, the regulation, the policy, the funding frameworks, all of those things, investment, that actually enables the, the residential development industry, both for-profit and not-for-profit, uh, to co-invest, to work with government to significantly increase supply, actual outcomes on the ground happening. It's, it's a real intent. I think it's worth noting that certainly in my background in state government many years ago, working in Melbourne 2030 development, that sort of uh, uh, that time frame, I think the attitude of the, the major developers at that point in time to affordable housing was kind of, it's not really, you know, don't have a problem with it, but it's not really anything to do with us. I'll, I'm seeing a really fundamental change with, with particularly the bigger players in, in this industry right now. They do see that they have a critical role to play not just in delivering housing, but in affordable housing, in finding ways, in forms, in formats that, that affordable housing could actually be generated. 
clearly they have some marketing journeys, they're not stepping away from those, but they're, they're playing a different game now, and I think that's worth kind of acknowledging, and, and they're seeing that affordable housing is actually not only good for their business, but it's good for communities, it's good for urban form, it's good for function, there are business opportunities in there, and, and it affects the, the other businesses, the not affordable bit of the businesses that they're involved in as well. So I think it's clear that we are starting to develop this affordable housing industry now, it's happening around us, and I think there's, there's some um, really key messages that the state government in particular have been coming forward with. So intents to you know, develop an affordable housing industry through financial products, durable subsidies, clear social outcomes, increasing the stock of community housing. These are things that people in government are saying right now when we're putting them forward. Want to find a broader range of housing assistance tools, not just deep subsidy public housing. So that that um, Fiona talked about the sort of focus on very low, low and moderate income households. It's a sort of wider range of housing income that we're talking about now, which kind of underpins the beginning of an industry. The notion of a sort of multi-model, uh, a multi-provider model for the delivery of affordable housing. So it's not just about public housing, and not just about a housing provider, a community housing provider, there are a wide range of ways we might go about this. So you can see these things emerging and it's a pretty important platform for us to be stepping into. On your seats there, you have a lovely piece of paper, looks like this. I'm not going to go through it, I promise there's a lot of words there, but it, it again reflects a bit of what Fiona was talking about, the fact that there are a number of players that need to come together to make outcomes actually workable on the ground. And the need to understand what each of those players actually needs in the, the, the delivery. What do you need? Who's going to give it to you? Who do you need to talk to? How do you play together? What's the role of government versus what's the role of a for-profit housing developer or a community developer or a financier? We've structured all of these things, but the bank won't fund it because there's something wrong in, in what they need. You know? Or we've come to all of this agreement, but the landowner won't go there because there's something wrong. So what we've tried to do as part of our work is to really highlight who are all these players and what do they need and where's the framework that would help them work together. While I'm there, and clearly within that framework there is a very specific role for local government. And I think you know, as local government, people involved in local government can know that there are some areas where you do have room to move and there are other things where you have very little space to move or very little control over what's going on. So understanding where that plays in is pretty important, I think. While, I'm, while you've got that little piece of paper, on the back of your piece of paper, uh, there's a little spruik that I'm going to put in here because one of the things that we've discovered as we've started working through this work as an advisory group is that there's a real gap in knowledge between industry players and local government. And from local government perspective, I think some, some either not strong understanding or perhaps misunderstanding of some of the development economics and the finance and tools that actually matter to make a difference on the ground. Because this group does have that knowledge and understanding, like the capacity to, to be able to uh, share their knowledge around feasibility, development economics, those things, the group is, is uh, thinking that it would be a really useful offer for local government at this point in time to run a masterclass, to uh, an opportunity to share some of that knowledge so that local government have, can build their foundation for what other people, other elements of this industry need to be able to be involved in those affordable housing discussions. So we've put it out there, we're looking for expressions of interest just to, to make sure that we have enough we will to do it, but we'd be really interested to, to hear your feedback and, and really encourage you to be able to pick up some of these opportunities and, and kind of skill up, I guess, because it is new and it's emerging and not everybody has all of the answers all of the time, so this starts brokering an, an interaction between us all. I guess the takeaway that I'd really like you to, to kind of keep hanging on to is we all need to understand both our own roles and what we need and the other players that, that need to come together to make this workable. So the group itself has spent quite some time looking through the various government strategies that, that have been put forward at the moment. Um, there's really strong support to, for the, the breadth of action that's going on at the moment from the group. And I guess that's feedback to state government in the first instance, but local, also to local government, because you can see the interaction with local government and we're trying to work out how they get traction with that. Um, we we recognise that these new steps start looking at what the planning system can do. Uh, and we recognise that the group absolutely recognises that there's a role for the planning system in there. 
uh, you know, really, really supportive of the incorporation of the definition and of the object in, in the, the Planning and Environment Act. It makes a very big difference in where you can negotiate from. Uh, and the steps to support effective voluntary negotiation, that's been alluded to. There's some really big difficulties in the way that those negotiations have happened previously, and often more too frequent, I guess is probably the right way to put it. Those negotiations have been really difficult for all parties. There's been lots of time and energy put into them, and actually they have either borne no fruit or very little fruit in some instances, and that's very frustrating for everybody involved. So real support for a, a more structured, more defined way of doing things. We do note, though, that the level of need far outweighs the current state investment, so there's flag. Uh, that th there's very little Commonwealth investment directly into this space, that's been bigger flag. Uh, that there's some state initiatives in here that, that we don't think will underpin that substantial new, su new supply of housing in general, let alone uh, affordable housing, and so we'll, we'll flag that as a, a, an issue. And I guess that the, a bit of a sort of word of caution around expectations of planning me mechanisms being seen to be panacea or being seen to be able to generate responses that would really meet the full raft of, of outcomes that are needed. We think that's very, very unlikely. We, we think that the uh, planning system has a very clear role to play and, and has a stronger role to play in where affordable housing might go rather than funding affordable housing in and of itself. That's not to say there isn't any movement there, but it's not to fund that in and of itself would be, would be the strong message of it. So planning system, very good for distributing outcomes, not so great for generating dollars. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that, that the group would flag a warning uh, around the potential impacts of some of these changes that, that might undermine development economics that will actually have a really negative knock-on effect for development more broadly, constraining supply will actually force up, make the affordable housing problem bigger in the first instance. So being really careful and mindful of that balance and, and not kind of uh, undermining what otherwise would have been the supply. And I guess that question about long uh, market lead times. Markets need long lead times to be able to adjust to things, so if there are going to be future changes, then the forewarning that allows the industry to move with that and incorporate it into the development economics is definitely a strong message that we're going to work. So, in terms of what's going on now, the, the voluntary mechanisms that are being put forward now give us a real opportunity to provide a strong framework to be able to, to get some affordable housing. We would still argue that a more systematic uh, approach will be needed in the future. This still relies on one-by-one one negotiations, but a clear framework for those negotiations is a good start. So let's just, just begin there. Uh, we would say that the negotiations, particularly from a local government point of view, need to be clear about what is the value that has been generated in some way here that has a local government saying, yes, we want to talk to you about an affordable housing outcome here, because local government has generated this kind of value in this way. We've shortened the planning system time frame. We've done something that generates a value. That's what you have in a, in a voluntary sense, because if it's voluntary, then there needs to be some sort of incentive for a developer to be able to move into that space. What is it that came to the table and why, and how are you having that conversation? Because that's pretty crucial from the development industry's point of view to be able to have that in place and understood. Uh, the, how crucial effective definitions are is a very good deal for us because actually from a development point of view you need to be able to say that one is an affordable housing outcome and that one is not so it needs to be very clear where you fall which side of the line because otherwise you can't work out whether someone's actually met the requirement of the 173 agreement that, that had been negotiated um, so we've had lots of interaction with, with state government with the planning uh, people in the planning bit, making sure that those issues and the reason why there's such a big deal for this industry group uh, it has been well understood and, and we've really appreciated the opportunity. I think it's a really good example of what a group like this can actually do because we've literally been sitting on the table going, if you do it that way, we think it's going to break this way, but if you do it that way, we think it'll work pretty well. And, so, and we think we've had really useful conversations that will lead us to somewhere helpful. Probably enough, probably enough. Hmm. Yeah. Um, and look forward to a bit more discussion and some, some questions and answers. Okay. So uh, <clears throat> let me uh, begin by 
acknowledge in those traditional custodians this land on which we meet, the Wurundjeri people, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And uh, we acknowledge the uh, continuing importance of their relationship to the land and their custodianship of the land, not just a, a past recognition. Um, so the, when I saw the title of this, uh, this session, Portable Housing Practical Solutions, and having heard Fiona and, and Nicola speak, I realised my bit's going to be at the practical end. Um, I'm certainly impressed by the amount of work being done by the department and by the, uh, the affordable housing working group. Um, but I'm going to uh, talk about my experiences uh, in the city of Port Phillip as a councillor and mayor and as a director and chair of Port Phillip Housing Association. Now that topic of affordable housing, of course, is massive and growing and difficult. Um, so nothing I say tonight is intended to mean here's the magic solution. Um, now for over 30 years, the city of Port Phillip has been recognised as a national leader in local government facilitating affordable housing. And it's been through great partnerships, not just with the Port Phillip Housing Association, but the state and federal government. Um, so that over the past 30 years or so, 645 units of social housing have been delivered in the city. And in a city like Port Phillip, where land cost is exorbitant, uh, that's a pretty good effort. Um, pretty hard to do many these days, but we'll get to how it can be done. So my intention tonight is to focus on the last 10 or 12 years because I think that can provide some suggestions around how local government can get involved and deliver on affordable housing for their communities. Um, one of my concerns about tonight is that you end up with a tokenistic approach to things. So some will go away and think, oh, it's like we it won't quite deliver. So I, uh, I don't, again, don't offer this as the uh, as the ultimate solution, rather this is some techniques for how things get, get done. And there are three core components that I see local government needs to uh, commit to. Uh, the first is, if the council plan doesn't have a, uh, a thorough commitment by this plan to talk about um, getting involved in affordable housing, a housing strategy and a plan, they don't have that commitment it's going to be pretty hard to progress on to anything else. So I think it's a fundamental responsibility of councils to build and maintain a diverse and inclusive community, which includes affordable housing and social housing. The second issue is I think councils need to be committed to using their assets and resources for the broader community good, including supporting the provision of affordable housing. Councils can't just have a theoretical put in this particular pie here. They've got to actually commit to it with resources and assets. And the third bit is because of the changes over the years, uh, the only way councils can really get involved is to have a partnership with a registered housing association. It's the only path through which uh, the new funding streams will be available. So let me give a bit of history. <coughs> so. Port Phillip Housing Association had the advantage of its roots being in St Kilda, which uh, going back of course was a fantastic place for lots of cheap housing options and I remember it well because I grew up there through the 50s and 60s. Um, but the combination of gentrification and rising housing prices means all that ground to a halt through the 80s and 90s. But uh, St Kilda back then and Port Phillip now there is a great store of uh, highly committed community-minded activists. And it was when they got hold of the St Kilda Council back in the mid-80s that things started to change. So mid-80s, 70s and 80s, uh, lots of the rooming houses, lots of the low-cost accommodation was disappearing out of St Kilda. Uh, but when the activists, and it was the term the Tide group and other so St Kilda groups, lots of things started to happen. So the <coughs> council appointed the housing officer, and then they got state government support to buy up old rooming houses, low-cost accommodation facilities so they wouldn't be sold to private developers 
and it would be retained as low cost accommodation. And it was around that time that, uh, and they were provided to council to be the manager, but council decided that it should set up a, a housing association, which was established, and it became the manager of council's social housing pro properties. Now, across the last 30 years, um, the focus has remained very strong that as a community and through the local council, provision of affordable housing is of vital importance. There's strong recognition of the benefits of having a mixed and vibrant community. And there's plenty of research around which will actually convince governments, I'm not too sure if they're absolutely convinced, of the financial benefit of actually housing people. A person who's uh, homeless compared with people in stable, quality and secure housing uh, is quite significant. The big change was in 2005 when the state government set up the framework for registered housing associations and Portfield Housing became a company limited by guarantee and was one of the first organisations to achieve housing association status. Um, and there's only nine, there were only eight, there's nine now. Uh, because there would no longer be any joint ventures between state government and councils like had previously happened under the Office of Housing. Uh, it would be, have to be done through housing associations. And interestingly, that became the catalyst for the City of Port Phillip to read the tea leaves and recognise that in the changing demographics of uh, St Kilda and Port Phillip, as it was by then, uh, there may in fact be a council in the future which mightn't be as supportive of social housing as the then council was. So that's when the City of Port Phillip developed the Port Phillip Housing Trust and uh, transferred all of those social housing properties into a trust. They appointed Port Phillip Housing Association, the company which I now chair, as the trustees. And it meant that it took those properties away from the potential political interference of a council which might decide it can balance the budget by selling a property here or there. So all of those properties are now held in perpetuity within the trust. Uh, the trust deed is very clear around uh, the fact that uh, it can only be used for social housing. So it's, a, it's maintained and protected the City of Port Phillips long-term investment and commitment to social housing. As part of setting up the trust, and anybody from local government here might feel a bit jealous when I tell you this, um, council also committed to providing $400,000 a year into the trust over 10 years, $4 million, which sounds like it was awfully generous and a lot of money, but uh, the fact is that when the, their properties were transferred to the trust, there was $49 million worth of properties. Uh, they provided $4 million plus the uh, air rights over a car, council car park, valued at $2.5 million. And for that uh, commitment and that input, the, uh, the trust now has assets of nearly $90 million. So we've almost doubled the assets for an, for an investment by the council of only $6.5 million. Um, we've delivered significant numbers of housing units and separately, the company, Portfolio Housing Association, has uh, delivered significant, even more uh, local social housing over that time. I think we've delivered a further 193. The advantage we had, of course, was a lot of that was done through the glory years of post-GFC nation building funds uh, and uh, the availability of uh, NRAS, uh, both of which unfortunately have disappeared. So life's a bit tougher these days to get that sort of increase in social housing. Uh, City of Port Phillip is continuing to do that same sort of thing. We currently have an agreed, uh, uh, have a heads of agreement in relation to another car park where we will build over the car park for another 50 units of social housing. It does require some uh, equity funding uh, and we're still looking at the state government to uh, provide that. Um, there was some interesting stuff around those definitions in the changes to the Planning Environment Act around the the uh, income levels for people of different uh, di different definitions, um, and maybe we'll get to it in discussion. But the uh, Victorian Housing Register proposal, which is still hasn't been finalised, the uh, intention to uh, I'll use the word force uh, housing associations to take seventy five percent of their tenants from that register off the tier one of that register, is going to change the uh, financing of these sorts of things. So. Uh, there's still, I think, some negotiation happened around that. 
So the council is committed to uh, ensuring that mix of housing, including social housing, uh, and as I said before, they need to do it with a housing association because there is some uh, there is some good money about to appear. We think the state government's uh, social housing growth fund and the federal government's bond aggregator, but those things will only be uh, provided to uh, organisations that are, in the state government's case, who are registered housing associations and have the capacity to uh, to make the money work. Um, so there's work to be done there, that's hence that, uh, that, that need to have a partnership. Uh, a couple of other issues which might prompt some discussion. Uh, the Public Housing Estate Renewal Program, which is a bit fraught at the moment, highly contentious. So our view, and consistent with the peak body uh, for community housing, is that that 10% uplift is not sufficient. I was going to say grossly inadequate, it's not sufficient. Um, but we do recognise though that a mixture of public and private development uh, is sometimes a necessary way to go, um, especially in the absence of government funding. Um, Port Phillip Housing Association did the uh, Ashworth Chatterton uh, redevelopment, which is a significant development, $140 million worth. Um, so we increased the social housing stock there from about 40 units to 210 units. But to do that and to make sure the funding stacked up, we did have 50% of the funding from the state government, the other, the other half, the other 70 million, we did also build and sell uh, 70 private units in a separate block on the land. That was a way of making sure that things stacked up. So I think there are ways of doing a mixture of social housing, private housing, to make uh, things financially work. But it's not necessarily our preferred model. Um, the, so the Social Housing Growth Fund, another excellent initiative by the state government. But when you think about a billion dollars in that fund, they got a 7% return, it's $70 million a year, which uh, doesn't build many houses, doesn't build many. You know, 200, 250, depending on where they might be. Um, when you look at the needs of social housing, uh, to keep Victoria just keep it at the bottom of the ladder, as we are at three and a half percent of our housing stock in the state being social housing, uh, you factor in a bit of population growth, and over that next 15 years, we need 1,800 social housing units every year over the next 15 years. It's a bit short of uh, 200, 250 out of the social housing growth fund. There's got to be other ways. We've heard some tonight. I'm sure the government's working hard on others, uh, but until we see some of those things, um, the, the, the prospects for uh, a good supply, the necessary supply of social housing in this state, is pretty dismal. Um, inclusionary zoning, another one, um, but I worry that uh, there will be ways around won't necessarily deliver good outcomes. So I, I do welcome those initiatives for the state government, trying to address it, but the problem is huge. And uh, to me, the reality is, unless uh, uh, the state government can see its way to actually put uh, real equity into social housing, it doesn't have to be everything. Um, if we get the right mix of tenants, uh, housing organisations can uh, fund between 25 and 50 per cent of the cost of doing that. The state government is willing to put the money in, uh, then we can start to really solve the problem. Until that happens, all these other things, I think, are just addressing some of the edges. Good edges, necessary edges, but uh, fundamentally, we're not going to solve the affordable housing issue. Thank you, and back to you, Anna. That's all I was <laughs>
um, kick it off with the panel um, to say, we're here tonight with the Local Government Association. If I could ask each of you to give you know, one headline piece of advice, what a local government could do, what's the most effective thing a local government could do to increase the supply of affordable housing in their local government? <coughs> Is it putting in place a, um, requirements in their planning laws? Is it um, educating developers? Is it investing money directly? What, Fiona, do you want to start? Um, yes. I, um, I agree with Frank that the first thing that uh, local government needs to do is basically have its own housing strategy and housing needs analysis so it understands the basis upon which it seeks to contribute to, you know, the wicked problem of delivering affordable housing. So as I said, you know, what is the basis upon which you are having your own then? And as Nicola said, Really what's happening with these sort of minor, minor amendments to the Act is it's at the starting point of really building up an industry and an institution, institutional support around being able to negotiate affordable housing outcomes and therefore being able to participate, even if it is at the edges, you know, I totally agree with Frank, looking at ways of building capacity to actually negotiate these agreements, I think that's a really good start. Uh, I think I agree with Fiona that, that those things are really, really critical. I think that uh, Frank's comment earlier around uh, being able to work with an affordable housing association to be able to get those outcomes on the ground and, and I think they're very useful. So if I take off my uh, chair of uh, advisory group and put on my uh, housing association hat, uh, our experience is that many local governments don't have enough understanding of how that works right now to be able to use it effectively. But actually, I would uh, argue very strongly that housing associations are actually a very strong ally for local governments in being able to negotiate with developers. So, uh, housing associations know the development economics inside out, back to front. Our financial imperatives are even tighter than developers are. So, actually, in being able to work out how you negotiate with developers, where they have room to move and where they don't. We, are, we, we can actually be on a breaker between a landowner and, and a local government, and that's something that local governments could use to their advantage really strongly. Um, so, they're excellent suggestions. So, maybe I could just do a simple little practical one. I wouldn't say that uh, uh, every local government area should do a thorough inventory of its spare land. Whether it's air rights over car parks, spare land galore, and uh, I think uh, that might wake them up to the fact that actually there are possibilities to work in conjunction with a registered housing association, look at what's there. Um, whether you need, I don't think you're gonna need a lot of these changes to the Planning and Environment Act. Councils can decide if they have that philosophical bent that they actually want social housing, affordable housing, and they can do it in conjunction with it. With it. Yeah. But they bring land, that gives uh, a good start to the whole uh, equity and finance question. Uh. Thank you all. Um, we'll open it up to a question from the floor now. Who'd like to kick us off? Frank, it's a question for you. Um, talking about land, so state government land is also out there within our shires. Is that land that you know we've got um, Bulb and Water giving, turning their water basins into housing lots? down in our shire down the south coast, is that sort of land that we should be looking at to create affordable housing in? It's land that's owned by Bar and Water, but it's, which was a state government department, and they're turning into housing estates. Well, things certainly have changed over the years, haven't they? So every state government department now jealously looks after its own bits of assets and uh, we want to sell them at market rates. If you start having to buy land at market rates, you're going to put some pressure on the whole funding arrangement for doing an affordable housing development. Um, so that's where I think uh, things like, uh, maybe it's more in the city than places like Bowen, but uh, uh, things like car parks, air rights above car parks, uh, council aren't going to sell those. They'll put a price on them to give themselves a few tips about what they've contributed to a social housing project. But, I think, that, I think there's real possibilities, certainly in metropolitan Melbourne, 
around using air rights above car parks. Council gets to keep its car park, it will take a few slots, uh, but they also get some, uh, some decent development. Thank you. My question is for Frank. Uh, you're very popular tonight, Frank. Um, you did make the comment that um, you're concerned that the state government wants you to take 75% um, off the waiting list for your stock for the um, housing. 75% to year one. Yeah. Can you explain that a bit more? And I'm just wondering how you would like to fill your units if it isn't off the already existing public housing lists and how they're going to be eroded if they're not being um, moved into accommodation. So we have always taken tenants off the public housing awareness. What's happened in the past, I think it's probably 12 months, there is now a common waiting list. So the people don't have to register with us, register with some other housing association, register with the department. So the, the affordable housing uh, organisations are all quite happy with the fact that there is a common waiting list. That's not a problem. Great idea. Great idea. Yeah. Um, but the problem is that uh, in the past, and this is how uh, registered housing associations have afforded uh, developments, um, where, and it's a bit like it's going to be defined now in the in the Act. But there's always been the housing registrar who. who is our supervisor, has always had uh, uh, levels of income and categorised people and as housing associations we were, we were not only allowed, I think we were encouraged to take people across a range so you get a good mix of tenants in your properties but you also get a good income stream so people up to um, the sort of jobs that might be necessary in a local area, local policemen, nurses etc. Um, and I think the level for a couple is probably eighty thousand dollars a year. Someone might know, so, some something like that. So there are people who who uh, perhaps can't afford to buy a house, willing to go into rental uh, at a discounted price. So you, you have a strata of people, including people right down to people who are on fixed government benefits. So there's a strata of people, and it's regulated. So we have to take at least, and the, the agreement with. Uh, the Office of Housing around doing any of these developments, if you've got any government funding into it, is you have to take at least half of your people uh, at the lower levels at uh, fixed government benefits or minimum wages. So this new proposal though is, is going to shift the bar up and change the mix. So it's going to say you have to take 75% of your tenants, not just from the general waiting list but from tier one which would be people who are otherwise going to be homeless, who are on benefits, unemployment, new start or whatever. So we don't mind taking those people. We think they're an important part of the mix of the community that you put together. But if you have 75% of your people coming from that list, you're going to ruin your financial model when you go to the bank and say, this is a sort of uh, rental stream, income stream we can see ourselves getting. And that's the problem. So we, we're looking for some negotiation around that that hasn't uh, been successful yet. It's worth noting in that context that for the housing associations, there is no direct operational funding to any of the associations to be able to meet the gap between what a household can afford to pay and what it actually costs to provide a house. So all of the decisions that housing associations have made to this point have factored in the expectation that up to 50% of the people that you house will fit these levels. But we, we have borrowed money to be able to increase stock and we have existing arrangements that didn't take into account a reduction in the likely rental income if, if you increase the, the protocol so that you now need to take both 75% and 75, those 75 very likely to be at the very lowest income level. So it really changes the financials and there's no other funding stream to be able to do that. And it also changes the, the, the potential mix and concentration of disadvantage into specific locations. From the local government point of view, that actually means that in any, any of those negotiations, the level of subsidy required to be able to afford to uh, manage property for those very low income people actually becomes much harder. The level of subsidies required is much greater, and that actually means that in the negotiation that you're doing with the developer, you either need much more subsidy or you need to provide much less of that particular kind of housing. So it's all, you, know, you could have two of those, or 10 of these, or some mix in between of 
know, very low income housing, moderate income housing, some, some mix across the spectrum. Could I just add to that, um, that the, the agreements we're talking about, the definition of affordable housing, isn't just for social housing. And in fact, the, the opportunity to be able to address the um, affordable housing issues for the other income streams, we view this as a really vital mechanism beyond the issues that the housing associations have with the director of housing about who they take under that social housing stream. So, you know, as Frank said, you know, the issue about key worker housing um, is absolutely vital. So, you know, that's why we have include, we will include a moderate income level, which is beyond um, what you would have in the box of social housing, because, you know, people need to be closer to where they work. And if you look at even recent articles about New South Wales, where um, police, teachers, uh, nurses are commuting two and a half hours a day to where to where they work. So we need to find some of those innovative solutions through this mechanism as well. I think that's incredibly important. I was just meant to mention the recent reports coming out of Sydney. I think we do tend to have this conversation around those people um, in the top tier, the people that otherwise be homeless, but in order for a community to be resilient and thrive, it needs to have the, all of those people across the community. And if we have local communities that don't have police and nurses and teachers and care workers and early childhood educators that can live within easy distance of their workplaces, then communities start to fall apart. So it's a really complex issue. Um, another question over here? Yeah, hi. Um, my question is mostly for Fiona, I think. Um, you mentioned, Fiona, that um, it's been recognised in the process you've been going through, especially with the great engagement, I shouldn't know how much you've been doing with local government um, around the legislative changes, section 23 or whatever, the capacity and the capacity of local government to engage and, and um, you know, be a effective partner is, is, is um, you know, perhaps not quite there. You mentioned that there's some inter interactive stuff, some resources online for that. Um, and then you said kind of something that we have stayed in the town a bit, you're leaving us to it. Yeah, um, I'm concerned about that because I, I, I guess the point I'd like to make is, you know, we're talking about parties like this, uh, we're talking about developers, we're talking about social housing providers, we're talking about council. Council isn't, especially if we're talking about delivering more than just planning, we're talking about delivering land. You might be dealing with many different parts of councils, and all of us who work in local councils know that some of these parts are very different ways and people don't know each other. And, don't know how to work together, and uh, the housing is very complex. Um, so I'm wondering about your thinking about the types of resources, even if it's kind of money that other people can kind of use um, to actually um, give um, build this capacity within councils to actually do this work, because um, it's it, it's complicated in, in in local governments to actually do even quite simple things, and then we're trying to do a complicated thing. We'll be working in state government. Firstly, I didn't mean to um, uh, say that the state government's going to cut and run. I guess the, the critical thing is that when a council with a developer and a community housing association negotiates agreement, the state government isn't involved. Um, we have funding through the Homes of Victoria strategy um, and you know the example of the masterclass that uh, Nicola and Kate were talking about. What we're trying to look at is whether or not the, um, through the, the planning component set up um, some arrangements around being able to work with the community housing associations for brokers, for example. So somebody who can assist the parties and knows them well, knows the issues around local council requirements, development economics, and housing needs for the housing associations. I see us being able to very much step into that space, and that's the plan. Um, we have to put through the instruments through Cabinet, and they get signed off in May, but the guidance and also a proposal from 1 July to be able to have a sort of a, a program of working 
with councils to actually build capacity. And again, it's understandable. There are, you know, councils who have been dealing in this area like Port Phillip for years, and councils who never had to see or deal with the 173 agreement. So we appreciate that, but it's very early days. And the key is, I think, councils being able to you know, understand what their needs are in their area and build up capacity. So that's what we're looking at. I've got a big voice. <laughs> Frank, um, taking out from Fiona's point, there's a lot of councils that haven't actually entered this field so far. Is there a business model for your organisation to actually provide the template agreements, to the documentation that supports the structure? <coughs> because there'll be a lot of, there's an enormous amount of learning that's got to be undertaken by those people who have not actually entered this field so far. Or even those who are, but haven't gone to the degree of sophistication that you have. In just the financial modelling of handling private and and, uh, and 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 social housing within the same property as tenants come and go. That that financial modelling is very sophisticated, from what I observed around what what Melbourne's uh, housing process. Um, so let me go to that last point first. I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't recommend the salt and pepper approach to uh, units. And uh, we've got uh, development coming up with, and, and we did the same thing at uh, Ashworth Chaston. There are um, five separate body corporates, and a sixth one is the, uh, is the private body corporate. Trying to have a body corporate or owners corporation with a mix of tenants like that. And given that we are housing people who are often uh, in desperate need of housing, perhaps have uh, difficult backgrounds, you're going, to, you're going to create additional problems for yourself if you don't need it. So, so there's ways of doing it. So that's why I wouldn't recommend salt and pepper. I can't say that we've got some magic model that we can trot out each time. Every project is going to be vastly different because of whatever, whether it's uh, the planning issues or whether it's the financing issues or ownership and on it goes. So that there are so many variables in these things that every project takes a massive amount of work. Um, I think there is uh, one council at the moment who's probably um, got a, uh, a fairly good blueprint, but I won't tell you which one it is. <laughs> That's just a tease. <laughs> so I, I actually appreciate Frank, Frank's comment around that the salt and pepper approach and some of the challenges related to them. Uh, I would just like to clarify that we as a housing association, we have a number of, of locations where we do have salt and pepper, and, and it works well for us. But it, the, it is very highly dependent upon the, the, the tenant mix and, and uh, the income levels and what's going on there. So there is a real horses and horses that goes on in the middle of that. Uh, I think the fundamental uh, answer to your question, though, is as I said before, work with your housing association because this is their bread and butter business. This is what they do all day, every day, and, and can interact with, with a, a local government. To, to be able to work through what this means in this location, this municipality with these tenants, with this kind of property, you know, is a soft prep approach a good idea here or a bad idea? It, so the, the notion that tenancy management for particular groups is simple or easy and doesn't come with a wealth of expertise sitting in a sector that already exists, it is a, a it would be a fair fee, I think, for a council to think it's, you know, it's just an asset, you can just manage an asset, do the number, should be fine. There's a whole lot of complexity that comes with the ongoing manager, management, particularly tenancy, but there's some questions about shared equity or, or um, affordable home ownership and things like that. So setting it up in a trust, as Frank said, or as opposed to running it yourself. So Port Phillip set it up in a trust at a point in time where the council itself owned those assets. Actually, if you're working with the Housing Association, the Housing Association owns those assets and is able to recycle those assets over time. In many instances, a council wouldn't need a separate trust necessarily, notwithstanding that if a council's bringing its, its own like land that has come from its own ratepayers uh, funding base, then that may well be a, a sensible consideration. If what council is doing is applying planning mechanisms that apply right across the state, then I, I would argue that there's much less need for that. The, the registered housing sector, regulated by the housing registrar, is actually has been heavily invested in by the Victorian state government to create a sector that can protect, if you like, and well manage subsidy that's gone into affordable housing outcomes. So trying to replicate those controls and, and further constrain them 
simply gets in the way of being able to generate the outcome as when you need it. There are some considerations that local government will want to know about. So, you know, when, when will you or won't you move a property out of my municipality? They're reasonable questions to ask and can be answered, but fundamentally, the regulation of the system that should hold and protect the value of any subsidy that's come to the mix is already there, and councils really don't need to do anything. It's much easier for you to not do anything. But you don't need to do anything extra to be able to do that because it already exists and, and this is the specialty of this sector. Local government has a different specialty in it and a different driver for what you should be looking for mm -hmm. and, it, and the development industry has different drivers again. Uh, oh, we're sorry, also preparing, sorry, um, a draft model 173 agreement that can be used as a template and lots of guidance material given that each agreement is basically site by site. So not everything applies in terms of what you can negotiate. Lots of guidance and case studies so that there's a basis upon which you can understand where you go to. Yeah. Uh, so the, the trust issue, um, I think really only applies if council uh, wants to put its own assets in there. And if there's a political overlay which says, oh, I'm too short, I want to give that away totally. So let's put it into one of our trusts so that we can, we can work in that way, yeah. um, we're similar to the answer, but I've got a lot of questions. I've got a question from Fiona, if that's good. Fiona, right at the start, you were talking about um, women, 50 plus, are now becoming one of our highest um, people of unemployment out there. So, um, what do you think is causing this group of women to be living outside of the area? Actually, did say, and I should say, but yes. And by you did say that, what is causing this? And the other question I have for it is we've got older women who are widows and stuff, and they've been forced out of their house because of their own tax burdens and things that are going there. Is there opportunities within the housing organisations to work with these people to help them build and set the house on the property for that sort of situation? Well, I can answer some of the, the causal um, questions for a start. So we, we do quite a lot of work with this group. Um, in our organisation at the moment. The causes are many and they're complex, many and they're complex, but um, it, it's a combination of, it's women's financial insecurity essentially that's leading to it. So it's, it's the fact that women take time out of the workforce to care for children, to care for other family members, they don't build up um, assets, they don't build up superannuation. Um, often if there's a, a, a marriage breakdown, um, the woman will choose to take the house and the husband will take the other assets. Uh, and then she is, uh, she may have that asset, but she's income poor, so she's not able to hold on to the house. Um, she may be unemployable because she's taken so much time out of the workforce. It's a, it's a widespread and complex issue. Uh, it's got a lot to do with how we structure our working lives, our social lives, and uh, financial services and, and financial systems. Um, we're doing some work, we're about to kick off some work looking at models of co-care or co-housing for older women that find themselves in that situation. A lot of co-housing models that have been explored in Australia so far assume that the person entering into the system of, of co-housing has an asset, much as the residential aged care system relies on them having an asset. We want to look at what models could be developed for those women that don't have a great deal of wealth or, or, or have assets behind them. Um, as to what uh, options there are for that cohort now, I'm going to throw yeah. it I think it's a really good example of why that the breadth of uh, income definition is important here because, in fact, for some of the women who are facing homelessness now or have very insecure housing outcomes currently, they're people that are, have finished their working life, so they have a little bit of super and a little bit of income, but which means they don't qualify for the, the uh, strongest level of housing assistance, so they're falling between two stools. The, the breadth of a income definition that allows a moderate income response actually allows for a discussion about someone who can bring a little bit of capital and might need a shared equity product or might need, you know, uh, might be able to pay market rent but is actually looking for secure and um, a good quality rental, which is something that in many rental markets is incredibly difficult to achieve in the structure of the market at the moment. So there's a whole range of options that might actually create new opportunities for people who are not being well served in the housing market now that may not actually involve very deep subsidy all the time and, or, or for long periods of time. So it, it gives a range of opportunities for associations like ours to start working with those cohorts to work out what would work for them and you know, where, where options could 
generate, and perhaps that's part of a wide range of options, perhaps, perhaps there's something targeted for those people. There's clearly a strong area of emerging need, which is really awful. But often there's people who've come out of caring roles, that they've worked in caring um, sectors, caring nursing, yeah, aged care, things like that, so they've never had a very high income, never been able to save a whole lot of money, and suddenly they get to the end of that. It's took their whole career looking after other people and now find themselves in a really difficult situation as the housing market's got more and more difficult for them. That's got to do with how um, poorly we recompense women's work as well. Um, but it's, I just also wanted to find it's also to do with the availability of suitable housing stock for those people. So they don't want to necessarily leave the area they've always lived in. They, they can't stay in the three bedroom house, but they're helping care for their grandparents or they've got a very elderly parent, but there aren't enough medium density properties available for them in their local community that are affordable for them. And that's a, that's a planning issue as well, which is interesting to me. But Marjorie, you want to ask me? Thank you. Frank, you mentioned the importance of local government having a partnership with the Housing Association. You also mentioned that there are nine across Victoria. Do they cover the 79 local government areas? Yes. <laughs> um, I, I would actually, I think it's worth clarifying that in some instances a strong partnership with an individual uh, housing association might make sense. In other instances, a relationship with a number of housing associations would also make sense. There's also a whole range of other housing providers that have a lower level of regulation, so they're not the agencies that were set up to be able to manage um, investment and equity and debt, but they definitely manage a whole range of products. And so with the subsidy available, those agencies are also able to, to um, be involved. So there's a whole range. Of there does appear to be a focus with the Social Housing Growth Fund only to have registered housing associations, not housing providers. So that's, that, 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 there are there are nine. Um, they, some focus on particular needs as opposed to particular areas, so not necessarily geographic. So there's a range. But they all have a, so some kind of specialty, I think, but either a geographic area, some folks on women were a co op organisation, so our, our strong members are in co op housing some disability, like that. so there's a range of, of ways in which you might interact with. Is there a role for uh, cooperatives in this uh, business of uh, affordability? The groups of people who have moderate uh, uh, savings who could uh, get together and uh, involve a developer get finance at a low interest uh, guaranteed by the state or uh, by the federal government and uh, uh, build a house that they will uh, pay a lot of money for 30 years and then borrow it. Well, there's certainly a role for cooperatives. So uh, cooperatives are come to their own at, at points in time where markets are ceasing to serve people particularly well, and I think if you look at our housing market, we are right there. We're an increasing number of people who are not being well served out of our housing market. Cooperatives, the, the best of them come together with them and go, you know what, I'm over this, we've got to sort it out ourselves. Uh, you went one step further and, and talked about uh, being able to access cheaper finance or a whole range of things. There's some discussion around those sorts of things, uh, and in some instances, in fact, Western Australia currently has some, some quite strong movement in trying to uh, arrange some of those uh, opportunities, and that has some examples where the state government has provided some uh, underpin some finance. We certainly, as an organisation, as the largest housing organisation, uh, we're certainly investigating what it is that we could do that might broaden the range of co op offer, and that definitely has us looking at things that can be done without subsidy or without significant subsidy and can be done with co -op, with capital that's being bought by uh, yeah, potential members. Um, so not there yet, but a, a very interesting avenue for, for investigation, and we do think that there's lots of opportunity. And certainly as a co-op organisation, we would advocate very strongly to, to anyone, and this is actually, but you know, people in the state government, that, that being able to use that interface to, to uh, make sure that the, you sort of stretch the market as far as you can. So if, if that gives you access to uh, slightly cheaper funding because you are a more secure and more stable housing outcome, you, you, your risk is lower. So it's not actually a subsidy, I don't think. It's actually about the function of 
the nature of co-op and what that looks like and where you might get advantage from that where we're very carefully working our way through what that might look like. Yeah, just a follow-up question. Is there a need for legislative uh, change in the status of cooperatives? Uh, are they equivalent to not for profit in that regard? Uh, so you can establish yourself as a for profit or a not for profit co op. You can establish, establish yourself as a distributive co op or a non distributive co op. So, no, I don't believe there's a need for legislative change. I think one of the things that doesn't exist very strongly across uh, Australia, Victoria, mm -hmm. but Australia at the moment, it is some. Um, direct investment in uh, organisations or resources that would help individuals work their way through what kind of co-op they want to be. So as I've said, we are the, the biggest co-op organisation in Victoria at the moment, but we actually use our members' rent to be able to manage the housing outcomes that they need. So taking a whole heap of that money and putting it somewhere else is actually quite difficult for us. So we, we yes, we are the capital co-op and yes, we do wherever we can be able to you know, offer uh, support for those who are trying to consider co-op outside of our program, but there isn't a limit to how much of the, the program's resources could be put to that because of where the, that, that revenue is coming from. And so there is no uh, kind of external funding source that would really support that. So it's another way of looking at where you might get that because I think being able to uh, work out how you help groups work together to effectively sort out their own answer to their own problem is, is a really useful thing to do. So it's in the mix, but it doesn't exist right now. And again, if I can just jump in, it is part of the project that we're looking at, and while legislative change may not be necessary, there is, I think, um, a need for us to look at some of the financial lending rules and how, how um, finance works. Um, so it's actually quite challenging for a small group of people at the moment to say we'll put some resources and borrow sufficient money to create a new property or to buy a new property. Um, and so there may, need, there may need to be some government uh, attention to that at the policy level. And I think the notion that, that groups of people who don't have serious expertise in property and development and, and you know, finance and all of those things, it's a big decision with a lot of risk. So thinking about the ways in which a, a cult organisation might be able to facilitate some of that, that, that removes some of the risk, that helps people make good decisions, that, that results in effective development, also something that we're thinking very hard about. And, and there is clearly an emerging movement around this stuff. So now we have a model in, in Germany where people are coming together and doing this and does have some much stronger institutional facilitation going around it. Uh, thinking about where and how that plays out here. It's happening organically anyway, and there's a couple of different organisations around, one not using a co-op frame and, and a couple of others that are starting to work out how they might use a co-op frame that is already emerging. Good question here. Yes, um, my question's for Nicola and Frank. Um, I'm a member of a community organisation, uh, Transition Village Wallen, and we've spoken about housing affordability, but I think there's definitely a need for immediate transitional housing, um, especially in the Mitchell Shire where I live. Um, and we're trying to work with council and community partners to build um, a village of tiny houses that can provide short-term, 12-month um, transitional housing so people can get back up on their feet, um, engage with community organisations to re-enter the workforce or, or, or some other kind of reintegration into community. But we're really struggling to engage local council and partners to get land use. Um, we had some private land that was donated for a number of um, years that was then rescinded because it was sold to a developer. So when we're competing with you know, rising land prices and people trying to make a profit, um, but we have a council that is very land rich, um, how do we engage, or is the council even able to um, use land for temporary purposes or, or um, how, how do we start that conversation where you know, this land is not going to be developed for 20 years, can we use it in the meantime? Um, I'd like to put that to the panel. I think it's a really tricky question, actually. I, I think uh, uh, I won't speak for local government, but my experience with local government would suggest that many local governments have hit some pretty tough times where a particular piece of land has been used in a particular way for a period of time, particularly a long period of time, mm -hmm. and then at the point where it needed to change for some other reason, that it's really difficult to negotiate that change. So I guess. My sense would be that a local government would, would need to work its way very carefully through how it manage community expectation around the use of that land. The other thing will be, it, it, it's less problematic, I think, in a tiny, tiny home scenario, but temporary use of land, even when that temporary is 50 years, 
temporary use of land in funding for housing to create, to, to build on it, to build an asset on it, from my point of view, is actually incredibly difficult. I, if I'm going to build on something where we're not clear what the use of the land can be at that point in time, I need to make sure that the whole thing's been amortised before we get there, because otherwise I've got an asset that can't be where it is. So there are real issues around the length of time and how you manage those things. Not uh, insurmountable, I wouldn't have thought, but certainly difficult, and I can quite see why council's going, hang on a minute, let us just think through this step by step. Raymond, did you have to So, <laughs> uh, Nicholas' answer's correct, but I, uh, the other thing that you need to think about is how do you get your council to work with one of the housing providers who are the specialists in transitional housing operation. So the housing associations, in our case, tend to be developers and managers of the houses we develop. We don't uh, do the major transitional housing management, which is done by housing providers, people like Launch or Some housing associations also have part of their service that's transitional housing, but that not all of us. So that is true. That's not a, a fear that. that Association operates in either, and we will be looking for a specialist provider to provide that function. So they, they need to do the negotiation with council and yourselves about what the possibilities are. We've got time for two more questions. There's one over here, and then one over here that's been waiting. Fantastic, thank you. Um, some people are asking what can local government actually do to get into this space, or how do you connect local government? We do have a housing affordability in our council plan for starters, and we know that you need to commit assets and money for that. Um, we had the largest, in Cardinia Shire, the, um, on the Mirror Cardinia Shire, we had the largest amount of domestic violence in front of children in a certain section of our shire. So therefore, we, we got a collective impact project together, which was around domestic violence. Part of that, during which time the, the Royal Commission had come out just before it, so there was obviously some money around to support people for housing, because as we know, uh, in front of domestic violence, for people to leave, they need somewhere to go. And if they've got nowhere to go, they often go back, or they go to friends, and then the person will find that person there. So we knew, as part of our project, we actually had to link up some housing with it. So we went around and we looked at all the places in our shire that would be accessible for um, social housing and particularly the ones that council owned. So we put, uh, we had found an area that was designated for something else in a housing estate, uh, was big enough to put on six units. Uh, we put an expression out to, of interest to different groups who might manage, let's say, women um, who, who are need affordable housing on a short term basis. The council decided that if it was something that they could live in for say 12 months to two to three years. So we had this expression of interest come back. We had some groups come back and talk to us. They would ultimately, if we were happy with their model, we would sell them the block of land at, a, at an affordable price, cheaper than what they would pay for it normally. They would build the asset on top of it and they would manage it. And we managed to find a trust who have got some of these projects already they're quite successful. The residents in the area were up in arms at first. They thought it was going to be an enclave for domestic violence. Uh, we've managed to assure them um, as much as we can so far that this is a, a bona fide area to do something in. Um, there'll be six units. Uh, there'll be terrace um, units. They'll have garages, a little backyard, the whole lot of it. Um, also, too, we look for some social housing in the main street. So we got in in touch with the government in relation to affordable social housing and we've got some land there which we think has got a little bit of a buffer sort of around it and we've sort of put that up that if they can come up with the right model we'll entertain selling it or leasing it out and they build the asset on top of it. So, so we've sort of been doing something in that space because we know you know, the, the, it's all nice to have a, and also to our project which Rosie Batty and the Minister supports has had a 30% reduction in domestic violence over the couple of years we've been running it. So that's that's really, but, but this, you need to have people, if you're serious, you've got to commit assets and you've got to put some finance towards it. Otherwise, it's just hollow speak. It all looks really good, but it doesn't actually do something. That's what we're doing in our space. I know it's not huge, but it's hopefully a little bit of a pilot for other people to look at. Thank you. 
Well, thank you. I'm going to take that as a comment, as they say on Q&A, and say so congratulations, and it sounds like a really successful program. Um, we just got one last question over here. Um, this is a question probably mainly for Nicola. Um, I work within local government, and we've been trying to broker an affordable housing um, agreement via the Section 173 agreement um, with a developer as part of a planning scheme amendment. Um, we've been doing it in the absence of a clear affordable housing strategy, and we feel like we're in a bit of a policy gap. Um, from what you were saying before, it sounds like we should be working with a housing association to broker those agreements with developers. But do you also think we should be working with a housing association to develop our um, affordable housing strategy as well? Um, certainly a housing association can help provide some insights into how you might approach a, a housing strategy. I'd have to say that there are nine housing associations and pretty much the advice that all of them will give you will be exactly the same. So many local governments, when they start trying to develop housing strategies, are, are, are seeking out a number of housing providers to, to get input. There's nothing wrong with that, don't get me wrong. But there is some really fundamental information that will not be different from council to council, from agency to agency. And so, in fact, the uh, Chia Vic, the, the, the community housing peak body, it is commencing some work right now to be able to put together a, a sort of package that might be more useful for local government. Because I think if you can get to the point where you've kind of covered off your basic research that already exists, Hartman can do it, Grattan Institute can do it, there's a whole bunch of that stuff that you don't actually need a housing association for directly. Um, and the, the kind of generic, uh, what is it the council is interested or willing to do in this, in this municipality, in these locations, in what way? These are things that are kind of need to be starting points. Once you've got to that point, I think then you could be saying, okay, housing providers in my area, what is it that you would need to be different or extra for, for us to be talking, you, you, that would make best use of your interaction with the individual agencies once you've already got the foundation in place. I think. Um, and where you've got existing uh, negotiations going on, they're happy, happening in a framework where there was no head of power in the planning system, it's happening now, there was no head of power in the planning system when you started doing this, and there were very little guidance around how you frame what you're even asking for, and so that there is definitely issues like that. I mean, we come across a number of them in a uh, councils come to us, or a developer comes to us saying, try to hang it with the council. The council wants five percent of everything. We thought when we, you know, when we commenced on this, it was actually, you know, I don't know, all sorts of different things, but you know, five percent off the, the market price, or you know, really fundamental different understandings about what the starting point is. And often, very little understanding of where was the value that had council saying we think we do, we should get an affordable housing outcome in this instance. Why? Because up until now, and still now, there's no mandatory power, so a council can't insist in this way. So, what is it that you brought to the table that provides the incentive? Because your negotiation actually should be about saying this is what we believe for creative value in this instance, and this is the way we'd like to see that value shared in affordable housing outcomes. So. Being a, a, a housing association can absolutely help you. One, identify what the value is worth and how realistic it is. So you're not actually having a hand in playing with the developer, but you're also not letting the developer say, well, that's, you know, can't do anything. So there's a middle ground in there very often and they can help you find that um, and then work through. Given this amount of value, what are the options to play that out? And in many instances in this scenario where there's been no head of power and no history, that that may be something different than 5% fully gifted because there's not enough value to, to support that outcome. So being inventive about what else you might be able to do that is still a true affordable housing outcome in the broad sense, you know, that might be that you're looking at outcomes that are suitable for moderate income households rather than the very low income households or, or some mix. But yes, we can help. Thank you. Um, you mentioned about 173 agreement though, it just reminds me of uh, Sometimes the difficulties with getting finance when you've got a section 173 agreement. Uh, women's women's housing in Hobson's Bay took almost a year to negotiate their finance because of the section 173. So projects can be damaged, delayed, etc. So there's there's a number of aspects to doing those sorts of agreements. Maybe, maybe yeah, so new 173s would be magic, but 
They yeah. certainly have some uh, problems with that. Yeah. And certainly part of the advice that the advisory group has been working with the department about that, that what these things mean and how they work when you put them on the ground and when they're helpful and when they're not. So incorporated into the guidance, I think, will be some discussion about when and how caveats on title sunset and things like that. So because once it's actually been transferred, you don't need it. It will freed up when it's housing much more to be able to use the Oh, look, look, really, just to say, it's not the only tool, but it is a tool. Um, and when you're looking at things like a planning scheme amendment, um, where it ends up essentially being like a permit conditions or mandatory requirement, you especially need to be clear as council, why are you asking for what you're asking of the developer? What, what's the basis for it? And if you don't have that, then you can understand that the agreement's going to flounder. And we have seen lots of examples in recent times of a council just saying, well, we want 20% or 20% of what? Um, and um, certainly from last year, um, or just gift us 20 units in this development and we'll agree with the rezoning and the permit application. It's not an even starting point for a negotiation and you probably end up in the UK. But I think certainly the fact that the head of power is the is, is now to be in place, and the guidance materials certainly help. I think um, councils negotiate some of those things. Thank you, thank you all, and I think you know that's a, a strong piece of practical advice on which to end our discussion tonight. Um, please thank Fiona Delahunt. <laughs>